Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The purpose of today's discussion is to discuss occlusal analysis and examination of the patient. Occlusal analysis is the examination and understanding the masticatory system in its functional and dysfunctional relationship. Since this system is not a single organ, but is made up of several individual units which ideally function harmoniously, we must examine each part individually and then together as they do function. We must determine what is normal for that particular individual. If it is less than normal and we see or find evidence of damage, we call it trauma from occlusion. What is normal for one individual may not necessarily be normal for another. To be normal is to be within the adaptive potential of the individual. In order to determine the range of normalcy, as well as find dysfunctional factors in the masticatory system, some systematic scheme of examination should be developed. The purpose of today's talk is to guide you through such a scheme. Now, the first thing we'd like to do is have our patient seated comfortably uh, we'd ask her to remove her glasses and her lipstick, and uh, we'd like to make sure that her head is uh, well supported on the occipital bone and that there's no stretching or discomfort in the neck region so that she has complete relaxation. The whole purpose, of course, is to have your patient uh, relax so they can cooperate with you and they will follow your uh, guidance as you try to guide them through this examination. And uh, you can relax your patient by talking to them. Some people become more naturally relaxed. Other people are very tense in this situation. And so if they are extremely tense, of course, you may have to depend on some drug therapy or so on uh, to help them relax. And uh, one of the ways you can check to see if this patient is relaxed is to Observe her as you uh, see her and talk with them and watch the uh, muscles in the cheek, the masseter muscle, and uh, see what happens. Are they a person that, as they sit here, this muscle begins to contract? And uh, if uh, we watch this patient, why we can see that uh, there's that little contraction of the muscle, which might indicate that she has some uh, problem with bruxism or clenching, one of the problems that we run into uh, with patients that uh, does create at times uh, trauma from occlusion, but not necessarily. But uh, so we uh, kind of observe them as we talk to them and see if uh, the patient does do this. Uh, the next thing we might do is ask them about their dental care. What have they had in the past? And uh, how many teeth have you had out? Are you missing any teeth now or that you know yes, of you I'm are? Missing. Could we just take a peek and see? Okay. Just on a quick examination here, we can see she has a bridge, uh, which would indicate she has a tooth missing here. And also, uh, we don't see any third molar. So have these been extracted or? Yes. Yes, so you had some oral surgery done and you're familiar with that. Uh, so she does have at least uh, four teeth missing uh, that we can tell by this examination. And uh, other than that, why well, I don't see any uh, thing that would indicate that she's had any problem. The chances are this uh, uh, second molar was extracted and the bridge was made from the third molar to the first molar. Uh, the other thing we'd like to check now is uh, one of the chief signs of trauma from occlusion is if the teeth are mobile. And so by taking a, a um, instrument such as your mirror and uh, by putting that against the tooth and pressing in this manner, you can check if there's mobility on the teeth. Now we won't do all the teeth, but we would expect you to. And if you see some very slight mobility on the anterior teeth, we could probably consider that normal, but if it's more than very slight, or if you see mobility on the posterior teeth, then we begin to wonder if there's a cause. So uh, we would use a mirror and your finger in that manner and try to determine if you have any mobility. And then by using the same instrument, we can come along and slightly percuss or tap the teeth. And uh, by this we mean taking, and not a hard blow, but just a, you can hear it. Now if you listen, you hear me tapping the tooth, sounds like a good solid sound. And one of the, another sign of trauma from occlusion, of course, is if you tap a tooth and it has a dull thud sound, uh, well, you might uh, be concerned uh, about the tooth. This is one of the more difficult things that you'd have to learn to do as you 
uh, go along. Um, so after we've tapped the teeth and so on, uh, why we would uh, uh, go all over. And if we have any, we discover any loose teeth or any teeth that are uh, sensitive percussion, we would, of course, make a note of that on our records. Now, the other thing we'd like to do at this time is have our patient bite real tight together. Just bite your teeth together. And then if you'd like to turn your head slightly, we would notice uh, the relationship of the teeth uh, one to another. Are they in what we might consider a fairly normal relationship? Or do we have cross bites where the uh, upper teeth or the maxillary teeth happen to go on the inside of the mandibular teeth? Uh, and, uh, of course, this patient doesn't have such a situation. But this is one of the things that we would uh, uh, check for to see if there's a, a crossbite relationship, which uh, may indicate some other problem then. Now, another thing that we'd like to discuss with the patient, ask them if they ever have any pain or discomfort in the area in front of the ears or the templar mandibular joint area. Have you ever had discomfort or pain? Yes. Were you treated in any way for this? Yes. Uh, and what did they do for you? Um, they did some adjusting. Adjusting on your teeth. They ground on your teeth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stand behind you and I'm going to palpate the joint. And I wonder, do you have any discomfort up in here now? Is that sore now at all? No. No soreness now. Mm -hmm. Okay, now would you open real wide and do it rather slowly now, wide as you can. Stretch yourself. Okay. Now, is there any pain or discomfort back there when you do that? Mm -mm. Okay, now bite up slowly again. Now, I can feel as she does that that there's a slight clicking or jumping of the, the joint. And I'm going to have her turn her head just slightly like this, and uh, maybe we can get a good view in this area. And then I'm going to ask you now, if you would, to open it real wide. Open as wide as you can, real, real wide. Now close very slowly, very slowly. Okay, would you do that again? Do that several times. Open real wide. And then we'll watch this area. There, oops, now go back and do it again. And if you're careful, if you watch closely at this area right here now, you will see it at that. See, now she doesn't do it every time, so we'll do it once more and see if we can pick it up. Stretch real wide and then close slowly and see if we can see that little, there we go. And that's a sign that there's some, been some uh, disturbance in that area. Now, it's perhaps been corrected by this time by her occlusal adjustments and she doesn't have any uh, pain or discomfort uh, at this time. Now, another thing we would like to do is to watch the midline and see that when she opens wide, does this deviate from either side? So I'm going to ask you again to open real wide. Now watch the point of her chin, and let's see if she has any deviation. Okay, very slight. You'll notice just before she closes, she has a slight uh, movement, and we do it once more. Now watch just as she comes almost together. See how the jaw goes a little to the left and back into the midline. So this is probably related somewhat to the same problem she had originally. Now another thing we want to do so they, uh, is to check their chewing pattern. In order to do this, we actually will just uh, give her a piece of, of green wax and ask her to chew it. And as she chews it, we're, we will observe her. And we watch her little muscle spasms that may occur. And if you watch closely, she does. She's slightly disoriented sometimes when she chews. She has a little muscle spasm in this area. Now, could you chew it on the other side, too? Some people have difficulty chewing on both sides, and I think she's one. She prefers to chew on the right side. Can you shift it to the left side and chew on the other side? Mm -hmm. The other side. Does that seem comfortable to you, or do you prefer to chew on this side? Both feel. Both feel mm -hmm. comfortable, fine. She seems to like to chew on one side. There are times when people have a restricted or unilateral pattern of mastication and they just absolutely can't chew on the other side. And some of this is habit uh, due to early problems with their dentition and other times it's a matter of uh, a preference. Sometimes there's pain involved and so on, but actually uh, she does a pretty good job of chewing on it. and. And I think she could chew on both sides, but I think she shows preference for here, although she does have a little uh, slight muscle spasm in her chin when she does chew, uh, which might indicate some uh, disorientation uh, and so on. Now, another thing we'd like to do is to check and see if we can pick up at this stage, and of course, you're inexperienced at this stage, so we don't expect you to be able to uh, do everything, but uh, you should be training yourself to check for interferences in what we call the working and the balancing and protrusive. 
And the way we do this is we ask uh, uh, our patient here to just bite together tightly now and bite tight. And then would you slide your chin towards me, just keeping your teeth now, uh, not straightforward. Now this is one of the problems you run into in examining patients. You say do this or do that, and they don't always, they can't always follow your uh, direction. So now what I really want to do is tell her I want her chin to come this way, and I'll touch her cheek, and then we'll have her bite tight together. Now would you slide your cheek toward your chin towards me? There, fine. Now you'll notice that when she does that, she has a tendency to stick her chin out a little bit. I'm going to ask her to bite up tight again, and now come straight towards me sideways. Now notice the difference? but she does have some interference on her anterior teeth when she comes into this area. Now we'd ask you to do bite tight and go over to this side, on the other side, the opposite side there. Notice the difference now? She rides more on the canine tooth and so on, but she still has some interference. Again, we'd like you to come straight forward, as far straight chin, straight out this direction now. Stand, whoa, right there. Now if we look inside at this time, if you can see in there, you notice all the pressure is on her front teeth. She's not able to, to uh, have any pressure in the back teeth. And this is called a protrusive movement, and of course it's ideal when they come into protrusion that the back teeth do disocclude. We don't want them to be in occlusion. However, all of her pressure is on her incisors, and as you uh, get further into this business, of course, you realize those are weaker teeth. It would be ideal if she had some pressure on her canines or her cuspid teeth. So. Uh, We'd make this note, we'd write in our uh, record that uh, this does occur, that she uh, doesn't have, uh, particularly when she comes towards the right, uh, she has her guidance on her anterior teeth. Now, now the next thing we're going to do is to measure what we call the vertical rest position or the freeway space. And the way that we will do this actually is we'll put a couple dots on her face, uh, one right under her nose and one on the point of her chin. Uh, which is a fairly immovable part of her face. And then by asking her to say the word Mississippi or getting her to relax completely so that she sits here, her teeth will not be touching, which is the way, uh, is a vertical rest position. Uh, why then we measure that and see how much uh, closure freeway space she has. So I'm gonna put a dot now right here and another one right here. Now this isn't, this is a gross measurement, and there are much finer ways of doing this, but for our purpose today uh, is demonstrating and for you to learn how to uh, uh, do this, why this suffices. Now, what I want you to do is get completely relaxed. Yes, let yourself completely relax. And I'll just kind of say the word very slowly, Mississippi, Mississippi. Mississippi, Mississippi. And then as you get at the end of the word, why just let your jaw stay in that position. Mississippi. Okay, now just hold Wait it now. Okay, get completely relaxed. Okay, and we can do it two or three times. Okay, now that shows 41 millimeters. Now would you bite tight together? See, and she comes up a little more than two millimeters. Let's do it once more just to... Mississippi. Completely Mississippi. relaxed. Mississippi. Mississippi. Okay. Okay. Now bite tight together. And she comes up about two millimeters each time, which means then that she has approximately uh, two millimeters freeway space. So when she is sitting completely relaxed or standing relaxed, why her teeth are really about two millimeters apart. And then when she goes into maximum interdigitation or centric occlusion, they come together. So we have that amount of space then between the, the uh, teeth. Now uh, we want to go ahead uh, and uh, check a few other things here. And uh, we talked about maximum interdigitation. The next thing we'd like to do is to place her in what we consider centric relation, where the joint is in the posterior, the hinge position. And we're going to do this again by getting her to relax and guiding her chin. And then we'll have her bite until she has the first contact. And then after the first contact, why we'll have her squeeze again and we'll see if there's any change, any difference between uh, centric relation, uh, the most posterior position. Uh, or centric occlusion, which is maximum interdigitation. And if, uh, if she has a slide, which I would anticipate she might, we're trying to uh, pick it up by showing the uh, movement of the tooth. So now what I really am gonna do is ask you to get completely relaxed, and what we'd like to do is make your, make your, your jaw in this thing, so just, just a hinge. So when I shake it, it, it goes like that. And, uh, and I will guide it with my thumb, and my thumb, uh, first you come and you just touch my thumb, 
and then I'll slip my thumb out of the way and we go all the rest of the way. Now, don't squeeze. The first contact, I'd like you to stop. So we're going to practice now, and you just let your jaw become just like a hinge. And she does it quite well. See? Now we're going to go up. Just relax now. Keep it completely relaxed. Now it's completely relaxed. Just complete. Now you're tightening up now. Okay. Just, just don't think about it, because when you think about it, why well, you have a tendency to want to help uh -huh. me. So we'll do it once more now, and uh, yeah, that's fine there. Okay, I'll just go a little more close, let it go. Okay, now you can see where my thumb has stopped the bite. Now, just keep coming up together. Fine, okay, just a little more until you find for the first contact, fine. Now squeeze together. Okay, now I can see from where I'm sitting that she does have a, a slight anterior and a little bit to the left slide. Uh, I think what we'll do is I'm going to try and do it again, and maybe we can catch this uh, again now on. I want you to stay real relaxed, and I won't put my thumb in this time, but so we can see better. Just relax now. Let you go. Keep going shut. Okay. Okay, now go up to your teeth. Just barely touch. Now you're fighting. Yes, you there we go. Okay, just let your teeth come together now. Okay, now squeeze. See how she comes anterior? A little bit, I don't know if you can pick that up, but she has a slight slide. I'm guessing it's a millimeter, a millimeter and a half, and uh, I don't think we can measure it uh, because the way that her anterior teeth, she has a, a great amount of overlap, vertical overlap. Uh, it would be difficult for us to get a, a, a ruler in to measure that. But uh, this is something that you have to work on. You have to practice with your patient, and again, uh, they may not be able to do this the first time, and uh, there are ways of Helping them, one, of course, again, is to go back to some type of relaxant drug. Uh, sometimes we put them on a bite plane splint to help them get the muscles relaxed and so on. And uh, so don't be discouraged if the first time you try it, it doesn't work. It's a matter of you uh, practicing with the patient, the patient learning to relax when you go along and do that type of thing. Uh, now, we've talked a lot about the examination, and we, uh, we've gone over quite a few little uh, features of the examination, but uh, we want to show the difference now between what we call the border movements of the mandible, the maximum movements of the mandible, and then we'll go along and show the uh, actual the envelope of function, uh, how much movement the mandible actually does go through when you're chewing and so on. So uh, what I'm going to ask you to do now is uh, similar to the thing we did the first time, is just uh, let your teeth go together. Now I want you to come toward me very slowly. Just keep coming to me. Fine, now stop right there. Just a little more, a little more, a little more. Now you can see this time we got her uh, chin back and she actually does have function here. Now would you like to come towards me just as far as you can? So keep going. Now you notice, see, she's way over here and of course the guidance has gone back to her anterior teeth. So go up slowly again. There, now she comes in and you'll notice at this time that she has a spacing between the canine and the lateral incisor, and we refer to this as a diastema. And that's something you might note. There is some spacing in there. Now would you like to go up tight again, right tight together. Would you like to turn your head toward me? I'll try to keep my fingers out of the way so we can. Now we've asked you to go this side as far as you can, but slowly. Keep slowly. Okay, you notice on the canine, stop right there. She has function. Now go as far as you can. Yeah. Now you notice, see, you can go way beyond. Those are the extreme movements of the mandible on the right and left direction, and of course it's limited by the ramus in the back. I'm sure she can feel pressure when you get out there and it stops you. Now would you like to look straight ahead? Okay, we're going to measure the protrusive now, and what we'd like you to do is to put your jaw forward just as far as you can, way, way out. And I'm going to take our millimeter rule here, and we'll just see. Now would you like to go back in position, bite up tight, Okay, and now slide your lower teeth straight forward all the way as far as you can. Keep sliding further yet. They're fine. And we come about five millimeters to six millimeters. So she has quite a bit of protrusive movement. Okay, now the other maximum border movement of the mandible is how wide she can open. So I'm going to ask you to open as wide as you can, and then we'll measure from one incisal edge to the other. And she has a, a very nice wide opening for us. And it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 36 to 38 millimeters. 
so that's uh, now those are the maximum uh, border movements. Uh, what we want to demonstrate to you now is that people really don't go into the, the maximum border movements, but before we do that, uh, they don't go into the maximum border movements during function, I should say. But when they, uh, before we do that, I'd like to look at the occlusal surfaces and see if we can see any facets of wear that may be beyond uh, those we'd anticipate for function. And uh, we'll just take our mirror now and, uh, and uh, look around at the teeth and see if we see any extreme facets of wear any place in either the teeth or the restorations. Uh, she has just a little shiny spot on an amalgam back here, which I don't think you can see very well, but uh, which would mean that perhaps she does at times. There you are, we can see it. And then we come on forward. Now let's check the upper uh, posterior teeth. And again, uh, I don't see any extreme uh, wear patterns out beyond uh, those we might anticipate. And then the lower anterior teeth, and if you notice on this tooth, the lateral mandibular uh, central incisor, she does have some extreme wear right in this area. This wear may be due to some type of uh, bruxing habit, or perhaps she's had some grinding by a dentist on some of her anterior teeth, but this is an, an extreme uh, a facet of wear. Now, since you have seen the extreme border movements of the mandible, we're gonna ask her to chew some wax again. And as she chews this wax, uh, I'm gonna try and part her lips so you can, and if you watch particularly the central incisors uh, on the lower and the mandible, uh, you'll see that, that all the chewing is really done in a very narrow uh, pattern. And this is called the envelope of uh, function or envelope of motion. So would you, just, I'm gonna let you chew it for a second to get it softened up and uh, just chew normally and then I'm going to reach in and uh, just uh, take your lips apart slightly so they can see. Once you get the wax off, the normal chewing uh, pattern. Okay. Now you just keep chewing, and uh, we'll just try if we can. Just keep chewing. Now you notice how she chews? If you watch, there you go. Just chew again. If you notice in the chewing habit why she has a tendency to chew on this right side and also she has a tendency uh, to go to the right. So she is following kind of a unilateral pattern. However, I'm sure that she probably could uh, learn to chew uh, on both sides. Uh, now I think with uh, what we've shown you today, really uh, what we want you to do is to go uh, to the um, clinics and labs now and, and uh, do the same type of thing on each other and uh, begin to get some uh, experience in the occlusal analysis and the examination of a patient. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.